Hello, this is Tim Congdon, Chairman of the Institute of International Monetary Research at the University of Buckingham. It's February 2021, uh, and this is the uh, usual monthly update on the global monetary scene. This time I want to deal with a question which is very much in the news at the moment. We've had, since the start of the lockdowns last March, we've had quantitative easing operations in several countries. And in my view, and in view of other people, this is going to lead to inflation. The question then is, why didn't QE operations, a bit over 10 years ago now, in 2009 and then in the following years, why didn't they cause inflation? This issue is raised by a journalist uh, on the Daily Telegraph, Richard Evans, uh, you know, he, says he offers a piece with uh, the reasons why QE didn't spark inflation in 2009 and why this time could be different. I'm afraid uh, Richard Evans right, asked the right question, doesn't reach the right answers, and that's what I want to do in this session. I have just been invited to give evidence to the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee on this matter. Uh, and th that um, session is available. You can see it uh, on the internet. Um, it, it's, um, in some extent, replaying a debate I had with uh, Liam Halligan, also has a column on the in the Telegraph, Sunday Telegraph, um, at that time, back in uh, just after the Great Recession, when I, I argued that the then program quantitative easing wouldn't lead to inflation, and Halligan said that it would. So this is very much an issue which is live at the moment, and I want to give you an explanation of why I got things right last time, and why I'm pretty sure I'm going to be right this time too. The point is that inflation depends on the rate of growth of the quantity of money. According to the quantity theory of money, Inflation is caused by excessive growth, the quantity of money, money growing faster than the quantity of goods and services. Seems straightforward enough, but in fact there's a difficulty here. There's more than one way of measuring money. Standard measures of money include some that only include money you can spend straight away without giving notice to the bank, so-called narrow money measures of money. Uh, there's also measures of money that include, um, in America they say, time deposits, in Britain deposit accounts, money where you have to give some notice to the bank before you can spend the money. And we then are talking about broad measures of money, sometimes called M2, sometimes M3, sometimes M4, it depends on the country you're talking about. And there are some economists who think that the monetary base by itself that's notes and coin held by the general public plus banks' cash reserves. They think the monetary base by itself is an important monetary aggregate involved in determining aggregate demand. We have a sort of beauty contest here between these different money aggregates. And what I want to do in the next few minutes is to explain why the correct measure of money in macroeconomic analysis is always one that is broadly defined. And this will then give us the answer to the question about QE. I'm going to focus here on the American data. You can see the different sizes of M1, M2 and M3 and compare that with the level of national income. You see at the end of last year uh, the uh, GDP in America was a bit over 20 trillion dollars and then last month January the quantity of money was about, on the broad measures, about 25 trillion. On M1, much smaller, a bit under 7 trillion. So the different measures of money are very different in size. But they're also different in behavior. This shows you the growth rates of money in the last year, year to January. You can see that M1 has risen by the rather extraordinary figure of getting on for 70%. And then you've got the measures of M2 and M3, M2 up by a bit over about 25%, and M3, 22%. Now, which of these three measures is the right one? 
or, or perhaps is it the monetary base as well that really matters? Here we've got a chart showing in America the, the difference between M1 and the base. M1 a bit larger than the base. Um, the base consisting, as I said, of uh, notes and coin in circulation and banks' cash reserves. And here again, a chart of the rates of growth. And you can see the base having this fantastic spurt last spring up by 30, 40, 50 percent in a matter of weeks when the Federal Reserve took the uh, aggressive action to deal with the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, and that's still a very high growth rate, but with M1 also now at 70 percent. Obviously, if there were a relationship between the base and M1, those measures of money and inflation, then there really is a big problem coming up in the United States. Well, I'm going to, there is a problem coming up, but it isn't as bad as all that. Let's just then think about what we're seeking when we compare these money aggregates. Most expenditure is done by the private sector, consumption, investment, stock building. And we want to have a measure of money that is relevant to determining those parts of aggregate demand. That's very important. It's the first thing that we should be thinking about. We want a measure of money that um, is, it isn't a puzzle about why it affects expenditure. It's rather obvious, for example, that uh, if a company is short of cash relative to where it wants to be, it's going to cut back on inventories. It's going to reduce its spending on investment. That will then affect economic activity. And we also want a measure of money where the direction of causation is not from spending to money, but from money to spending, and also from money to decisions on investment and portfolios. Then that the further remove, asset prices are going to affect spending. Those are the criteria that we should follow when we carry out this a beauty parade of these different money aggregates. Let's think first of all about the monetary base. We've got these two bits, notes and coin in circulation uh, and uh, the bank's cash reserves. Now nowadays, spending using notes and coin is less than 1%. In fact, in many economies, a mere half percent of total transactions that are conducted in bank deposits. Look, they cannot possibly be relevant to determining aggregate demand as a whole. What about banks' cash reserves? Banks are responsible for some spending. Obviously, they pay their staff. They've got to invest in their infrastructure, the payments infrastructure, and, and so on. But the total amount of money spent by banks as such in, in paying staff and investment is not much more than 3% of GDP. Look, the monetary base cannot be by itself relevant to determining aggregate demand. Obviously so. Some people claim there's a relationship between the base and the quantity of money. In the last 10, 20 years, there hasn't been one. We can cut out the base by itself. It's not relevant by itself to determining aggregate demand. Sure enough, there may be some effects on the quantity of money, but then it's the quantity of money that really matters. A lot of people say when the central bank grows its balance sheet, which affects the size of the monetary base, this is important by itself to economic activity. It isn't. We'll come on to, there's only those very small parts of demand that are affected by the base. What about M1? M1 includes uh, site deposits, money that you can, checkable deposits, money you can spend straight away. But M1 is part of M2, larger measure of money, and M1 can change because people shift money to and from um, the different types of deposit. You can shift money uh, from a time account to, to a site account. Uh, that can affect the size of M1 and then has no further relevance to the economy. All right? The quantity of money is adjusting to the economy, not determining the economy. The direction of causation is the wrong way round doesn't meet our criteria. So we cut out M1 as well. 
That 70% growth rate of M1 at present doesn't mean America's going to have 60% plus inflation. Nonsense. What about M2? Well, M2 is much larger. In America at the moment, it's about $20 trillion. Compared with M3, about $25 trillion. But again, there's this problem that M2 can change because the holders of the money balances switch between a, a deposit held inside only M3, part of that $5 trillion of only in M3, and the $20 trillion in, in M2. M2 also may be adjusting to the economy, other things happening in the economy, it doesn't affect the future course of economic activity. So we cut out M2 as well. It may seem rather drastic, but I don't look at, look, at, look at M2 anymore. It's become only part of broad money, not all of broad money. So we're left then only, by cutting out all these other measures of money, only with M3, broad money, as it's understood in the USA. It consists of all money balances. It therefore cannot, by definition, be changed by a switch between different types of money. If you've got too much M3, the only way you can get rid of it is by too much M3 relative to national income and wealth. There has to be, and the quantity of money is given, it has to be national income and wealth that do the adjusting. The direction of causation is the right way around. Okay. Let's also be clear that M3 is held by households, by companies, by financial institutions, and we can relate those bank deposits, households involved in consumption. Companies are involved in investment and stock building. Financial institutions are involved in buying and selling assets and affecting asset prices that then hit back to economic activity. So we can tell a story with broad money, with M3, about the behavior of the economy as a whole, and that is the measure of money that we want. That's the measure of money that meets the criteria that we set out as, as, as important to determining macroeconomic outcomes. Let's then revert to our question. Why is it that QE didn't cause inflation in the early 2010s, whereas in the view that I've been presenting in, in uh, the last few months, it is, going to be present, it is going to be causing inflation in 2021 and 2022? Well, it's simply a matter of looking at the growth rates of broad money. Here we've got the chart of the growth of M3 uh, in the United States of America going back 15 years, so including that period in the early 2010s. Yes, the Federal Reserve was conducting QE, but at the same time, banks were restricting they're lending to companies because of new capital regulation rules. And so overall, the growth of M3 was very low. And indeed, for some quarters, it actually fell, despite QE. Correct forecasts using M3, there's going to be no inflation. What about the UK? Same story. You see the slow growth of money in the early 2010s, very slow, only 2 3% a year. Despite QE, and again, because something else is happening, the banks were restricting their loans to the private sector, which was cutting back on money growth. Compare that with today. See, in America, we've had the money growth rate, the BEM3 money growth, up at 26% earlier, earlier in, in, in the middle of 2020. At the moment, come down a bit, still very, very high. Uh, and in the UK, the growth rate of broad money now up at about 14%, way ahead of the trend growth rate of real output. So what's crucial in this statement, inflation is caused by excessive growth of the quantity of money. It's caused by excessive growth of the quantity of money broadly defined. And this explains why QE didn't cause inflation in the 20 in the 2010s and is causing inflation now and will continue to do so for another two or three years. It isn't the presence or absence of QE that determines inflation. What's important is the rate of growth of the quantity of money. Thank you.